Good morning. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. I want to uh, do a three-part, actually it'll be a four-part ending with uh, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, um, on why we need Christmas. Uh, obviously, because you get discounts on gifts during the whole month. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that the world goes through with Christmas, and now, you know, they just, and I feel sorry for them sometimes on a corporate level because they don't know what to do. Happy holidays. And I go, which holiday? <laughs> you know, I don't say, you know. Anyway, they, they, they're just really having a difficult time with it in so many ways. But uh, we, of all people, should know why we need Christmas. And it starts in, actually, uh, before Genesis, but uh, we'll pick it up in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Um, first of all, though, to understand the value of what we're reading, because that's under attack on a regular basis. I'm not going to go into depth, but I want to give you just a couple of things that could help you. One of them is called Beyond the Cosmos, an excellent uh, read. It's a transmit. Uh, uh, dimensionality of God by Hugh Ross, and uh, it uh, it's just astounding. Anyway, that will help you a lot with uh, some of the issues that come up concerning Genesis and the the expanse of the universe and all the things that are happening and what we can understand by it and uh, what it actually proves in our relationship with the Lord. And so that's an excellent, excellent book. Uh, this one, though, is by Richard Milton, and it's called The Facts of Life Sharing the Myth, or Shattering, rather, the Myth of Darwinism. This was the number one book in England for years. It never made it over here. Some question of why that is, but he deals in such a thorough way uh, the, the issues of uh, evolutionary thought. Now, he is not a believer. He writes this strictly from a factual standpoint. He says, I don't believe in the Judeo-Christian faith. That's not where I'm coming from. He says, but you have to look at the facts. And the facts tell them that they're on the precipice of absolute Ignorance. It's not a good sign for them. I like this little cartoon that kind of tells you what it's about. <laughs> I think it's up there now. Yeah. This is not a good sign. <laughs> and the, the, the book will give you all the background. I'm not going to go into all of it. I just want to touch on it a bit so you know that Genesis, uh, though it's under attack, has so much more value scientifically in every possible way. But here's some examples that he supports with thorough documentation of uh, the, the physicality, the physics of our universe and uh, metallurgy and everything else. Uh, uh, recent evidence based upon just the chemical analysis of what's in the sky, what's in the air, what's in the earth, uh, says that the earth is as young or younger than 175,000 years. Uh, Experiments at Harvard and Columbia show there is no natural limit to change. In other words, in our lives, our bodies change, but it doesn't produce uh, natural selection. Um, can acquired features be inherited? Darwinists say no, but Nobel Prize winner research uh, in the U.S. shows us how they can, and he documents all that. Is there proof of the missing link between man and ape? Darwinists say yes. But the latest evidence says no, absolutely no. There's no evidence of any transitionary form in any, in any living being. Um, and he goes on to how can, he, how can the evolutionist uh, Darwinist get it so wrong? Volcanic um, lavas dated by the, uh, uh, the argon radioactive dating method is three billion years old the ashes from a volcano, but they know 
the volcano where they got the ashes is 190 years old. That happened when Mount St. Helens blew up too. Uh, they dated that in millions of years and it was only weeks old. Uh, the Earth's radioactive dating clocks have been reset by supernova and reversals of the Earth's magnetic field. And the, uh, the rocks of the Earth crust have been formed in thousands rather than millions of years. And then he documents exactly what he's saying there. And I just want to take one small portion of this and share with you. One category of impossible mutations has to do with uh, precision engineering, engineering uh, to limits that we would find extremely difficult to emulate. The off-quoted eye is, in fact, uh, not very precisely engineered. Its elements can vary by substantial margin, and the eye will still function reasonably well. Some natural structures, though, require an accuracy of a millionth of centimeters. The silvery skin of fish is designed to provide a reflective surface that enables them to remain camouflaged and unnoticed by predators. In the greenish gloom of the sea, to, the, to achieve this, the fish secrete millions of tiny nitrogenous um, crystals in layers on their skin and scales. But that's not all. To increase the efficiency of the reflective coating about, uh, from about 25% reflective to as much as 75%, the fish secrete multiple layers of mirror crystals sandwiched between layers of cell tissue. But to be effective, the layers have to be arranged exactly one quarter of the wavelengths of the incident light apart. For the greenish light of the undersea world, this means a separation of seven millionths of a centimeter. In other words, between every uh, little crystal. That's the division so that when the light hits it, it does exactly what the fish wants it to do in reflecting it so they can't see the fish. It, that doesn't evolve. <laughs> does anyone really believe, he goes on, that this, this precision was achieved by random mutation? It cannot be duplicated. We can't even duplicate it. The aspect that fascinates me most, he says, is the fact that there is some kind of counting or timing mechanism at work a mechanism that recurs in animals and plant life. A, a few random examples will explain. The artichoke plant, for instance, grown by gardeners for its fruit will crop for three years. The plant then dies or sometimes lives on but will crop no more. However, if a cutting is taken and planted, it will crop for three years. The common variety of uh, um, asparagus grown uh, crown, rather, will crop for 17 years and then cease. Human uh, children have two sets of teeth. The first set come through a miniature size ap appropriate to, uh, to the child. The second teeth come through uh, full-grown at adult size, even though they, they usually appear at around only seven years. There is a species of bamboo tree that uh, flowers every 117 years and cacti that flower every 12 years. The um, uh, pedigmigran and the, uh, the arctic fox assume a whitish coat in winter and a brownish one in summer. It goes on and on of all these phenomenal things that happen that have no justification in evolution. Can't be done. It, it's absolutely impossible. And um, one of the things, like find the argon thing is, he does a, um, oh, where to go now? Uh, oh, um, see cosmic dust particles and uh, uh, microchromatoridis tights continually enter the Earth's atmosphere from space and, and settle on the surface. Hans Peterson, oceanographer, a graphic institute of Gutzburg, has measured the rate at which this dust arrives and has found that it is constant from year to year at roughly 14 million tons annually. The implications of this finding are pretty clear. We are dealing with a process which consists of uh, aggregation of random 
uh, micro events, which is not known to be interfered with by any outside agency and whose starting value in the present context is not relevant. It is not relevant because it is the absence of dust we are concerned with. Morse points out that if the Earth is 4,500 uh, 4, 4, million years old, then some 63 million billion tons of dust have settled on its surface. The Earth has a surface area of a region of 5.5 uh, times 10 to the 15th power square feet, and compacted dust can be assumed to have density in the region of 140 pounds per cubic foot. These figures indicate that enough meteorite, meteoritic uh, dust would have entered the atmosphere to create a layer of 180 feet thick. This layer clearly does not exist, nor anything like it. Um, he goes on then to describe uh, what happened with the, uh, with the moon. They expected uh, to have anywhere from a minimum of three feet up to uh, something like 180 inches of dust. And the footprint <laughs> obviously shows there was that, not that dust on the moon. So it's not here on Earth, based upon the age dating it should be. It's not on the moon. And uh, the, uh, the radio, if you take the radioactive helium in the atmosphere, uh, just based on what's there and how they know it occurs, then the Earth is less than 175,000 years old. If you take the punting, uh, what they call Robertson effect, it's less than 100,000 years. Persistence of interplanetary dust, it's less than 100,000 100, years. The non-equilibrium of car carbon-14, it's less than 30,000 years old. And the, um, the persistence of short uh, period comets, it's less than 10,000 years. Magnetic field decay, it's the Earth is less than 10,000 years old. Dissolved nickel in oceans, it's less than 9,000 years old. Uh, because they know the rate at which nickel dissolves. And so if it was billions of years old, we would have more nickel on the planet than we would have a planet, basically, just like the dust. Meteoric dust in the atmosphere uh, would mean that we have a recent origin of the Earth, less than 9,000 years. And the continental drift, or the ice cap rupture, they call it, it means it's less than uh, the, the, the recent origin of the Earth is less than 9,000 years, probably closer to six. Interesting. It's well documented, it's thorough, the facts of life shattering the myth of Darwinism. You'll have to get it online because you're not going to find it in bookstores and I had to buy this used from England. And he tells you why they, they support Darwinism and everything else and what the, the, the system behind it is. But the facts are just overwhelming and, and more and more the scientists that are really true scientists are going, come on, you got to come up with something else because Darwinism does not work under any science. So, I just want to give you that as a little bit of background before we get into Genesis 3 so you know that what he's saying here is the truth <laughs> and has been validated in everything from the fact that we sit on the globe and the globe sits on nothing in space. That was written well before science ever figured it out. It says now, in chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, first of all, the serpent. Um, the first thing that we need to know about him uh, and why we need Christ, uh, Christmas is because we are no match for the devil. In um, Isaiah... 14, if you go with me to Isaiah 14, it tells you something about him. In verse 12, it says, How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down from, to the ground, you who weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above God. Above the stars of God, I also will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farther sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. That is pretty arrogant. That's the kind of spirit that we deal with when you talk about the devil. 
Yet, he says, you'll be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the earth. And then he treats him as if he was a man and uh, not a spirit because of God's judgment upon him. And then Ezekiel 28. In Ezekiel 28, you've got this person called the king of Tyre, which is a evidence of a representative of him getting to the point of Lucifer because of what he says about him. In, in, in verse uh, 1, or in verse 2, he says, because your heart's lifted up, which we saw in Isaiah 14, you say, I am a god. I sit in the seat of gods, in the midst of the seas, but you're a man and not a god. In other words, not that he's physically a man, but he's just, you're, you're, not, you're not even more than a man. Here he is, an angelic being, but he's, he says, you're, you're just a man to me. Now, we understand that this is about the devil because of this. In verse uh, 12, he says, you were the seal of perfection. This is the one that uh, if you think that you can stand against the subtleties of the devil and the wiles of the devil and the power of the devil without the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, he will take such advantage of you. The things that you say, I would never do this, you find yourself doing it. He says, you were the seal of perfection full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. That's why we know this isn't King Tyre, that that was simply a metaphor for who he is. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardis stone, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the turquoise, the emerald with gold, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. At the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes. It literally speaks of this, the musical instruments as a part of his body. Have you ever heard some of these people that can imitate people, that, and then there's those that can imitate instruments, and they make the sounds of those instruments? That was him. Except he didn't imitate them. He was that instrument of praise and worship. Literally, those sounds were coming from him. I, he perfect in beauty perfect in wisdom. You were the anointed cherub who covers. Now, it's evident that he was the cherub that covered the throne of God and brought praise and worship to the Lord. Now, when his fall, there's two, and we see those over the ark. But he fell and he took a third of the angels with him, we know in Revelation. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones, and you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in your heart. And that's when he said, I will be like the most high God. That was the iniquity. Um, you know, why God created the devil? I mean, think about it. If we didn't have the opportunity of choice, and include, including that angels having the opportunity of choice, then, like the song goes, what's love got to do with it? <laughs> you know, if you don't have a choice between obedience and not obedience, of loving and not loving, we're robots. And so he created a being that was absolutely perfect and so much like God, he thought he was God, which tells you that that cannot happen again. The only one that comes close to that is the Antichrist, and that happens because he's filled with the spirit of the devil. And so then Adam and Eve were given the place of choice, created in the image of God. You have that choice. What do you do with that choice is the question. But to have the choice, there's got to be something to choose. One of the reasons for Christmas is something to choose. Just understand what he's done. Now, let's just read through this. He's the woman said to the serpent, now the, the, the serpent says to her, right, uh, you shall not eat of every, is, is, is it true that that's what God said? Because Adam, it was told to Adam and Adam told Eve that. And, he, and the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Well, God didn't say that, and 
And if Adam said it, he probably said, look, just don't even touch it, <laughs> you know. But that's not what, that was not the commandment. So that every time we add to the word, that's always a problem. Because then as soon as we do, if she touched it and she didn't die, she'd go, well, gee, maybe I can eat it. <laughs> you know, as soon as we cross the line a little and add to the word, and then something happens in relation to that, then we don't believe the full word. He said, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, he said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Sound like the devil? Knowing good and evil. Now you think, why should we be blamed for Adam and Eve? Why should we get stuck with it? If we were Adam or Eve, we would do the same thing is the point. And we have inherited their genes, but even outside of that, we would do it. Proof of it is where you're at right now. Every choice that you made that there was something presented to you which was good or evil, and you took the evil because you wanted to know the knowledge of good and evil. When you leave your innocence as a child, then you find out that some of your choices aren't so good because the choices are to know evil. Well, what's it like to do this or that? Oh, I won't go as far as these people do. I'll just smoke a little, drink a little, do this a little, do that a little, steal a little, lie a little, whatever it is, just a little. Oh, I would never cheat, just flirt a little. There's always a point of entering into the knowledge of good and evil. It's our sin nature. And their nature was no different than ours, except now we inherit it from them, but we're just like them. God knows that in the day you eat, your eyes will be open. Yeah, you'll know. The moment you enter into something sinful, your eyes are open, right? You understand. And, you, and, he, sa and he says, oh, you'll be like God knowing good and evil. Is that really a good thing to know what God knows? You know, the more I find out about what's going on around the world and sex trafficking and some of the other things that, that happen in cultures and, and the slaughtering of people because of their beliefs or where they were born or the color of their skin or something like that, you know, it, it sickens you. To know good and evil, just to know about it is bad. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise... She took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Ladies, be careful with your power. <laughs> be careful with it. He knew better. She was deceived, according to the scriptures. He was told directly by the Lord God. He disobeyed. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Prior to this, they were, they were naked and they were unashamed. Kind of like children, I think, in that sense. Just not a thought about it. What, they didn't go running around and playing when they're little kids and going, oh, gee, you're naked. They're just playing and having a good time. And all of a sudden, you, that innocence leaves, and it's like a cover-up and change and everything else. That's happened to them as adults. They're just, you know, not a thought about it. And all of a sudden, hey, wait a minute. We're different. <laughs> and there's a nakedness there. And they're aware of it. And with it came shame. And so they covered up. What the world says now is no shame, no blame. I disagree with that. I think shame is what brings you to the cross when you go, I am sorry for what I did. I should be ashamed. I'm not talking about shame for something somebody did to you. That's where the devil really piles it on. But shame when it's your fault. 
Don't brush it off and say, this part of it was my fault. I'm ashamed of it. I'm ashamed of myself. God, forgive me. You'll see the victory. What they do is they go from that to blame. (sighs) Nothing new under the sun. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Because he had fellowship with them all the time. Adam and Eve, his wife, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So they covered themselves up. It was they created their own religion, if you will, to cover their shame. And the Lord said, he called to Adam and Eve and, and said to them, said to him, Where are you? It's not like he didn't know. He's God. This is a theophany of Jesus Christ. He appears to them, he walks with them. We see it all the way through the Old Testament. And it's like saying to your kids, you know, uh, what are you into? You know what they're into. What are you doing in there? You know what they're doing. I remember my dad had a liquor cabinet. And it was right by the front door. And I was walking out. I was getting into it. And he said, what are you into? He knew what I was into. (laughs) You know? God's going... What's going on there? What? Where are you? <laughs> so he said, well, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. This is one of the reasons why we need Christmas. Because our response to God is when we're found out, afraid. People leave church because they get found out. People don't go to church because they get found out. People afraid of God in the wrong way. Because of Christmas, you know that he loves you anyway. But there's more than that love, a lot more than love. Because he loved him there, didn't he? He had fellowship. He said, hey, what's going on? The, uh, the difference that took place that takes you right beyond all of that, there was a, a blind girl that, uh, you know, the Bible says that the uh, uh, he's talking to the Pharisees, and he says, you know, you, you say that you see, but you're blind. And the blind are the ones that see. <laughs> you know, they were calling out, heal me, right? And he said, you see, you, you're the one that needs healing. There was a blind girl, girl, she hated herself purely for the reason that she was blind. She's the only person she didn't hate was her loving boyfriend. He was always there for her. She she said that if she could only see the world, she would marry him. And uh, one day someone donated a pair of eyes to her and uh, she could see everything, including her boyfriend. And he said, now can we get married? And she looked at him and she realized he was blind. And she said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to marry a blind person. I didn't get my eyes just so I could marry a blind person. And he went away so upset, sent her a note Please, dear, take care of my eyes. The Lord has done so much for us, and the response of the world, my response before knowing Christ, was, I can see, I don't need you. I know what I'm doing, I don't need you. And saying I could see, I was really blind to the fact that he gave me life in the first place. He gave me the ability to comprehend, free choice. All of that came because of his sacrifice, born, died, and rose, and gave me his life. And then I look at it and go, I don't even believe in God. (laughs) But he's the one that gave me the ability to think those thoughts, to choose for myself, to be in the very image of God. We are a mystery, aren't we? (laughs) And then God called to Adam. He says, where are you? And uh, he says, well, I heard your voice. I was afraid. Uh, I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? Of course he knew. But he wanted Adam to, he wanted to, see what, you know, to get Adam to say what he's thinking, kind of what it's all about. Then the man said, well, the woman who you, who you gave me, <laughs> you gave her to be with, you gave her to me. <laughs> 
So he's blaming her and God at the same time. She gave me the tree the, uh, of the tree and like, and of course I ate, you know, after all, my wife. So of course I did. And the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you've done? The woman said, well, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Her first place was talking to the serpent. His was listening to his wife instead of the Lord. Not listen to his wife. God told Abraham, listen to your wife. But listening to his wife instead of the Lord. Hers was listening to the devil instead of her husband. The relationship of what we do with the information that we've got has not changed, has it? Lord said to the woman, what is this that you've done? He says, because you have done this, you are, and then he said, the, 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 so the Lord said to, to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle, more than every beast of the field, and on your belly you shall go. And, and the serpent is symbolic of who the devil is because he was standing up talking to her and everything else. And, and I think there's a lot more to this when you get to Genesis 6. You see that fallen angels were, saw the daughters of women as beautiful and they mated with them and had children that became giants. And look what he says to the devil. And, and she was in awe of the devil, I think, enough to talk to him when she shouldn't have been. He says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman. Well, you'd think it'd be there anyway, right? Evidently it wasn't. And we see what happens in Genesis 6. And it caused a great problem. So he says, but not anymore. Uh, between you and your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Speaking of uh, what happens with the seed, Christ. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception, and in pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be literally for your husband is to rule over your husband, but he shall rule over you. It's the same words. Then to Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree, because I command you not to, saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. And so it's just sweat and blood to do that. Now, uh, What happens because of this, they are born in heaven, if you will. They were born paradise on earth, heaven on earth. And um, Adam called his wife Eve, the mother of all living. In fact, all the DNA ge genetic studies and everything else, they all come back to there's one woman that is, has the DNA for all of us. They all acknowledge that. Uh, even the Lord God said, in verse 22, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil, and now at least he put his hand, and here's the point, and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. If he had done that and lived forever, he would live forever in sin and there'd be no redemption because his eternity would be bound up in the sin that he had, he had entered into. There'd be no way out. So therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the, um, uh, now a cherub is one. A cherubim or a seraphim is two. Why would you have two? One angel can kill 186,000 people at the minimum. We know that from the scriptures. So why would he put two at the east of the garden and a flaming sword also, which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life? What was he guarding? From who? The devil. Because if the devil could get the tree of life, he would do it again to give to mankind. So he gives imitations of it all the time, but he doesn't have the real deal. Not until the cross is the tree of life. Cursed is everyone who would hang upon the tree. And what Jesus did was gave himself a sacrifice, but first he had to, the reason for it is because of the sin that is in mankind that our choices are our own. And we choose to know good and evil, to know the difference, in other words, and get involved in things. We break the laws of God and we find that we need a Savior just as they did. They were, from that time on, we were born outside of paradise. 
we are born uh, with the death gene. And that death gene that they, they talk about, the sin gene, in fact, they call it that, causes us to die. And they really don't know why all these things happen in our body, but God has ordained it. We die. But we die in several ways because um, we are born body, soul, and spirit. Now their bodies would die after about 900 years and that kept going down and down until the point of after 70 you can live to be 80 but anything over 70 is going to be with much pain. <laughs> That's what it says. But uh, there's a limit now to our life span and there is obvious death no matter how old. Um, so the body dies. The, um, the spirit died then and there. And we are born with a dead spirit. Our soul is the only thing that lives of the Trinity within us in God's image that lives forever. Flesh and blood won't inherit the kingdom of God and our spirit is dead, dormant at the least. But when you give your life to Christ, what comes into your life? The Spirit of God. And he becomes one with your dead spirit and the resurrection takes place. You become born again. Now you have the Spirit of God in you. You are now the place where Adam and Eve was in the garden. You have this new life and now you see things through spiritual eyes instead of carnal eyes. And you are brought, literally, the kingdom of God is then within you. It's a part of your life. In Psalms 23, 2, it says, He restores my soul. He constantly, by His word of God, restores our soul. It's a daily process when we walk with the Lord. Uh, the soul needs converting. In Psalms 19, 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The law can also be translated the concept of the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word is the converting power. The law is that which drives us to Christ, and the con conversion of it, all of it is for our soul's sake. The soul is who you are. I'll never forget this lady. She was in her 90s. She was dying, and I said, how are you doing? She said, oh, I got my bones. And she said, it feels like broken cement. I can't get out of the bed. And I was, no, I said, how are you doing? How is your soul doing? And she lit up, and she goes, oh, she, I feel like I'm 16. Her soul, not her body. She knew the Lord. She knew where she was going. She knew what her life was about. In um, uh, Psalms 1, or 16, verse 10, it says, for you will not leave my soul in hell. That was the devil's soul but it also applies to us. When your spirit is alive, your soul is converted, you're not left in hell. In fact, you're immediately in the presence of God because he went to hell for you. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verse four, it says, the soul that sins, it will die. Are we any different than Adam and Eve then? Is there anyone here that hasn't sinned? Would you please take the pulpit now and I will leave. We've all sinned. We all fall, fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous. No, not one. You say, well, that's not true. I, I love what Ray Comfort does in the explanation of the terms of the use of the law. Have you ever told a lie? Yes. Well, then you're a liar. You've broken one chain in the laws. You've broken them all. We've all sinned. Some more, some less. It's, the degree doesn't make any difference. If you're, you know, <laughs> swimming to Catalina and you get about four feet off and you're drowned and the other person gets 20 miles off and then drowns, both drown. <laughs> we don't have what it takes to get to heaven because of our sin. The soul that sins, it will die. So the body dies. 
the soul dies, needs to be restored. It's a process in our life as we go from innocence to sinning, and then we find our soul dead, our spirit dead. We call out to him because he came that Christmas was the beginning process of saving our soul, saving our soul and giving us his spirit. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, he says, don't fear those who kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, but fear rather for him which is able to destroy both the soul and body in hell. You know, people that have gone through horrendous trials in life and have been tortured and killed hold on to that verse because no matter what somebody does to their body, they can't change their soul. So the one to fear is the one that can save your soul or your body or send both to hell, right? That's God Almighty. The subtlety of Satan to take your soul by uh, seeking after the world, by denying the need for the cross, Go with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16. Let's see here. Lost my spot. In Matthew um, 16, verse 21, from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and, he raised, and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside, began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Here's the deal. In Genesis, they were kicked out of the garden. And uh, what we didn't read in there, but later on he says, he, and he killed uh, an animal and provided skins for them, so he covered them, the shedding of blood. But that would always have to go on during the whole Old Testament as a symbol of God's forgiveness. Something had to die. The wages of sin is death. Here, Peter is deceived by the devil. And he was a disciple. So how's he going to be see, how's he going to be saved? God came and provided the sheep. He provided a means. He provided prayer. He walked in the cool of the garden. He was there for them. And yet it continued to happen over and over and over again. In other words, every means that were necessary or possible, he provided. He fellowshiped with them before, before they were uh, even possibility of redemption, just gave them the purity and the innocence, and they rebelled against it. He, fe he tried to fellowship with them then. They were kicked out of the garden. The only way he could have fellowship is if there was something that died in, in its place as a promissory note towards the death of Christ, and he kept coming back and loving him. But... They were like that blind woman. Said, well, I can see now. I don't need you. Not realizing what he had done. So he'd have to come in such a way that was more than just, and I don't mean just, but just being there as a theophany, as Christ appearing and talking to him and fellowshipping with him and, and, and speaking to them prophecies and everything we see in the Old Testament, but have to be literally the sacrifice for our sins. The subtlety of Satan was to, uh, there with Peter, really to rob him of his soul uh, because he did not want what God wanted. Jesus said, look, at there's going to be suffering and death. I'm going to die. They're going to kill me. And he said, not so, Lord. And he said, get behind me, Satan. Here's Peter. Walk with him for three years. But if you think you can stand without Christ against the subtleties, not even the power, just the subtleties of the devil. It's the subtleties that got Eve to fall. It's those little things that get us off, you know? It's like, I don't like all these controls. Well, that's like a river saying, I don't like all these controls, so all the banks are washed away. What happens to the river? 
becomes a marsh. Nothing but dead things live there. God has a destination and purpose for you, and so he puts the walls on the river to get you where you need to be to be a value for life and substance to everything that's a part of who you are until you get to the destination of heaven. If we think that we don't need him, we miss what happened to Peter because Peter was standing on his own saying, I mean, he said to the Lord, it can't be that way, Lord. It's like when we take the word and say, that can't be the case. And his answer to us is, get behind me, Satan. Well, wait a minute, I'm not. If we listen to the devil, we're walking with him. If you walk with somebody, you're in agreement with them, right? Evolution denies God. It is from the devil. And too many Christians go, yeah, I believe in God, but I also believe in the devil, or the evolution. And they say, oh yeah, I believe in God, but I don't believe all the Bible, it's true. Am I saying they're not saved? No, but I'm saying they're walking the same ground that Peter walked in. Jesus brought us Christmas. He became part of who we are to do a work that could only be done if he became a part of our life. Not simply walking with us, but to be a part of who we are by his spirit. Think about it. Um, Paul, um, in Romans chapter seven, understood it. And I think that's why he was so powerful. He said, you know, the things I wanna do, I don't do, and the things I don't wanna do, I find myself doing. Who, not what, who will deliver me from this body of death? King David understood that. In Luke 23, 34, this is, I think, one of the primary reasons why we have Christmas, is what Jesus said on the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Adam and Eve didn't understand the consequences. We don't understand the consequences even as believers like Paul. But because Christ died and rose again and comes into our life, it started with his birth to be a part of our life, to be one of us, to be with us, and our flesh can still listen to the devil or serve the Lord. But... The difference is he will never leave you or forsake you, no matter what you do. As the young man said to his beloved bride, enjoy my eyes. (laughs) What God has done for us, the Christmas, It doesn't matter whether it's on the 25th or not. I thank God we have a date or we wouldn't do anything. But do we have a time that we know that God did everything possible in forms of government, of countries, of people, of Christ walking with people, of appearing as like an angelic being to them, I explained to him from the garden, everything possible providing the blood sacrifice of of an animal to die in their place, all to get to the point of saying, now there's only one thing that's gonna be permanent and last forever, and that's if he became flesh and dwelt among us. And that he would be that sacrifice that we might see. Let's pray. Father, we we thank you as we approach the Christmas season as a reminder, what a blessed reminder of who you are and what you've done. We pray that we would come running back into your arms because of the gift you've given us. We pray that we, like Paul, when we find ourselves not doing the things we should do, would realize that you look at us and go, you don't even know what you're doing (laughs) and still forgive us, and that we can count on your love and your grace. We thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you that you have provided 
through that first Christmas morning, a brand new beginning for all of mankind that all up till that time would be looking forward to that moment and everything from that moment to now looking back to that moment that you became flesh and dwelt among us because indeed so often, most of the time, we don't know what we're doing. But Lord, we do know one thing. We have choice and we can choose when we realize by your spirit what we're doing to call out to you and like David said, God, against you and you alone have I sinned, that we can come to you and know that we're forgiven. As John would say, that if we call upon you, if we repent, that you are faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and then walk in your spirit, be filled by your spirit, have our whole life, our soul changed, our, 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 our life resurrected to be with you, our spirit one with your spirit. As we're praying, if you don't know the Lord and you want to know him this morning, I want you to raise your hand. I'm going to pray with you right now to commit your life to Jesus Christ. Can anybody else? So I'm going to pray. We're going to have just a short prayer, but it's where you're at in the Lord. Okay? Anybody else? Okay, God bless you. Let's pray. Father, forgive me for my sins. Come into my life and save my soul. I believe that you died, you rose again, and you give me eternal life now in my, as I place my faith in you. And Father, for each one of us that have walked with you for any, any amount of time, that we'd recognize the significance of what you did to become flesh and dwell among us and give us eternal life. We look forward to Christmas to celebrate, to remember that we, as all mankind has been, from Genesis on, are in great need of you, our Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.